Good morning. Happy Easter. Uh, the first reading today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed G Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And the second reading comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of God. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Matthew's Gospel, the 28th chapter. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he, has, he is going before you to Galilee. And there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. This time I'll ask the children to come forward for a children's message. And we're going to face the altar this morning. You can scoot in. I, I won't poke you in the eye. Mm -mm. Okay. Teaching safety zone right here. All right. Now, are you able to see the screens up here on the, on the sides there? I'm going to put some pictures up. And I'm going to ask the question, is it a good empty or a bad empty? Okay. And we're going to look at some images. So put that first image up there. An empty refrigerator, good or bad? Thumbs up or thumbs down? Now, maybe if you're an orangutan and you already had a big lunch or a big breakfast and you only, you know, it's there's only one banana in there. That's not a lot of food. You like the banana? I think that one's only good for banana bread. All right. So let's try another picture and see. An empty plate. Yeah. You can tell you're a teenager, aren't you? Almost a teenager, right? Yeah. How about an empty belly? No. Good empty or bad empty? Bad empty. Okay, let's look at another picture. What is that? Empty Look at your dads. They're freaking out. That's like the man's greatest fear in life is that that thing gets empty. Right, is that bad? Yeah. You ever seen that when you've asked for something? Right, your parents ever open up their wallet and say, do you see? Yeah. Okay, the next one. 
Empty candy wrapper, but it was a big Snickers that's supposed to satisfy. Now it's thumbs down. Thumbs down, you need more chocolate? I want more chocolate. Oh, you want more chocolate? I can tell you've had some. All right, we got another one. How about that one? No. No? no. Have you eaten it all yet? Yeah. No. I had hot wings and chocolate last night. Not good. Not good. Not together, people. All right, one more. This is the hard one. Good or bad? What is it? It's a cocoon. It's an empty cocoon. It's a beehive. No, it's not a beehive. It's a cocoon. Why do you think it's thumbs up? It's thumbs down. Thumbs down. Yeah. Yeah, even though we don't see a butterfly, what do we know when we see an empty cocoon? There's one flying around somewhere. Some caterpillar's got wings now and it's flying around. That's cool. I've had a butterfly. Yeah, you've had one? And I let it free. And you let it free? They, they prefer that. I found a butterfly outside of my back yeah. and I stared and stared and stared at it. Yeah. And I, Here's the great finale. One more slide. I was like, whoa. Good or bad? Good. Good? Good. Does everybody know what that is? A tomb. What do you do in a tomb? What do you put inside a tomb? Dead people. Uh, Dead people, right? All right, it's a matter of fact, you know. They're burying them underground. And then you rolled the stone there, but what's laying on the bench there? What's that cloth up there on the bench? Somebody was wrapped in that. They were buried in it like a mummy. Where'd they go? He rose, right? Almost like the butterfly that left the cocoon today in the gospel reading when we read about Jesus' resurrection, Matthew tells the story with an empty cocoon, so to speak, an empty grave. But you know what that means? We might find Jesus walking around like that beautiful butterfly that we discover that's no longer in the dark cocoon. And we'll see that Jesus in just a minute. Yes. You, yes. Yeah. She's excited about your ministry. She's got, she's promoting it right here in front of me. So yeah, that's a good empty. That's the best empty ever. And I want to tell you something. Here's the best, the best news of all. Even one day, one day when Jesus comes back again, all the graves of people who believe in him will be empty, not in a scary way but in the most exciting way. They'll come back to life just like Jesus did. Let's pray. Can you fold your hands and bow your heads? So Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and dying for us, for being buried, and for coming back to life. This is the best story ever, and we ask that, it may be, that we may be part of that story every day of our lives. Lord, bless all these children with faith throughout their lives. Let them never fall away from it, but let them have this firm foundation that there's a good empty, an empty tomb, but the best thing is a heart full of you. In your name we pray, amen. All right, thank you. Find a parent, any parent. You know what this is? Yeah, I want you to imagine it. Can you put that first slide up, the sermon slide? Right? You ever watch that TV show, Crime Scene Investigation, CSI? There's like 20 versions of it. And it doesn't matter if you've seen that one or maybe 48 Hours, any of those kind of TV shows. And it's amazing that they get the ratings they do because they pretty much tell the same story every time. Let's do a real quick run through of how these stories work. So number one, life's going on is normal. So you can imagine that. And then, whoa, a body, right? Okay, so a body's discovered. Forensic team shows up, the tape goes up, chalk lines and all that, and they start to gather all the information, right? But these shows are tricky, right? So they tell you just enough facts that you think you know who did it, right? But then a missing piece of evidence comes to light or something that was misinterpreted gets interpreted correctly and they figure out who done it, right? And then they capture that person and they put them on trial and then the criminals go to jail and there's a little bit of closure. At least the police feel happy about it. But 
But you ever notice there's always that family that has the lingering effects that despite the crime being solved, their loved one's gone, right? The person doesn't come back to life. Well, that is, unless you tell this story. This is the most amazing true story that you'll ever hear. It's a true story by eyewitness accounts that have been retold for 2,000 years. This isn't the myths and the fables and the stories that you hear in religions of the world. This were people who touched and held on to a man they knew for fact was part of a crime scene. Take a few steps back to the story before the angel comes down out of heaven. Why are the women going there in the darkness? What are they hoping to find? These women, just hours before, the day before, were outside the tomb while Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who were two secret followers of Jesus, had asked permission for Jesus' body to be taken down from the cross. They washed off as much of the blood and the dirt that they could. It was dirty business getting crucified. And they took Jesus and they honored him and they cleansed him and they washed him. They put on perfumes and ointments so that it would smell good as they went through the process of getting the body prepared for the tomb. And they quickly wrapped him before the Sabbath day began and placed him on the bench inside of that tomb. But you know what? And then they rolled the stone away. But nobody, when those women were coming to finish up that funeral, they wanted to do, they wanted to play their respects and they wanted to add their ointments and things. They knew the crime scene. There's no who done it in the Easter story at all. We know. We know who did it. We know that the Roman Empire and the Jewish leadership who hated each other who were often at war and who contrived, who bought each other for money, oftentimes vying for power and influence, came together at the strangest tragic moment of history to rid the world of Jesus, who seemed to threaten their power. Not with earthly weapons and politics and the power that we see in this world, but with his message and his revolution of love. They didn't want to let go of the things that they held tight to. So Jesus had to go. It was a terrible crime scene. It's, a, it's, it's an injustice to see Jesus get his own chalk line. But that's what God came into the world to do. He came into the world to show us that when the world does its worst, worst, when it's all said and done in those darkest moments under the heaviest sin, under all of the human tragedy and all the failings of governments and people and the disbelief of their hearts, when it's all said and done, God can reverse the crime with resurrection and forgiveness. Those women went to the tomb, but they had no idea they were visiting anything else but the chalk line. They were worried about the police tape of the stone that was rolled in front of the tomb. But as they got there early in the morning, an angel of the Lord descends from heaven and like a lightning bolt. And he rolls the stone away and he sits on top of it. And I love what happens to the Roman guards who were eyewitnesses of this, by the way. There's going to be two sides of the story. They're going to do the fake news side. His disciples will tell the truth. And it's always that way. Always that way. Jesus has survived fake news for 2,000 years, okay? And they'll always come up with it. But those guards, when that angel came and sat on the tomb and that stone rolled away, they fell down like dead people, right? And then the angel spoke to the women who had come there. And she says, come and see. Going into that tomb, you would have to stoop down like going under the police tape. And you can imagine in their hearts and minds, there's no other conclusion that this is just another episode of CSI. This is how it always ends. This is the pattern. This is what happens to human beings when the world does what the world does. They die. And it's a tragedy and their hearts were broken. And they went into the tomb and the angel says, come and see the evidence. And they go in and all they find is that emptiness. Can you put up the side of that tomb? The burial cloth lying there 
Jesus having risen from his bed of death and come back to life again. John even records that the face cloth that was on Jesus' face was neatly folded up in a part by all by itself. And the angel comes in and he says, you know what? I got to spoil this for you all. Jesus told you it was going to happen. But you see, we're so used to the patterns of this world that we miss, even when it's eyewitness testimony of what God's doing, we can miss it because we've bought into the patterns of this world. Even amongst Christians, sometimes we've bought into the pattern so that even when victory's right in front of your eyes, we see defeat. And the angel says to them, don't be afraid. I'm going to tell you what happened. It's just what he said happened. Psalm 16, verse 10, has this wonderful line in it. It says, God would not let his holy ones see corruption. He wouldn't let Jesus decompose in a grave. And though in that psalm it doesn't seem to jump out and say, this is how it's going to happen, nonetheless, it was there all along. The spoiler alert, long before Jesus came into the world. And even when Jesus said, the pattern is about to be broken, they will crucify and reject me, but on the third day I will rise, we have no place for that in our minds and hearts without the work of the Holy Spirit. And then they saw the evidence of that, and they went out of the tomb with fear and great joy. I don't blame them. Great joy that that was enough evidence for them that he was alive, but they had no idea where. They got to go and tell his disciples. This is the, the great twist in God's story. The body finds the people. In this story, in the resurrection story, it's the body that finds them. And I love the fact how Matthew records the greeting. Jesus found them. He met them on their way out. And they grab his ankles and they worship him. The body met them. And not just the dead body that they stumble over, not the chalk lines, but the resurrected Jesus. And the crime, nothing more than scars to remember. Jesus raised and living right before them. And you know what Jesus says to him in Matthew? And I love this. Good morning, ladies. That's simple. Jesus is brilliant. Because that's no just good morning. Jesus changed good morning forever. He used the same greeting they always used, but they would never hear it the same again because they were hearing good morning after that dark night and that dark day in the tomb. Jesus stood in the graveyard and said, good morning, ladies. A new day had begun. All the things that Jesus had begun in his ministry that they believed were now over, dead and gone and sealed in the tomb, case closed. All the things that they thought, all their expectations of Jesus that are now a cold case file in them because Jesus is a lifeless corpse, now are alive again. And Jesus was saying, I'm just getting started. Then Jesus tells these women, go and tell the disciples to meet me in Galilee. Why? Because we got to say good morning to the world. All throughout the book of Acts, we see the church do the one thing Jesus said the church is supposed to do. We do lots of things. Most of it, we made up on our own. But the one thing Jesus told his church when he ascended into heaven, tell the world good morning. There's a new day dawning. There's a new creation dawning. There's a new world coming. There's a new body coming. There's an everlasting life coming. Go welcome the world to me. And the early church will welcome those that crucified and pierced Jesus. They will welcome those that were far off. They will welcome those that don't speak their language. They will welcome those that don't eat their foods. They will welcome those that don't look like them. And they will all become one family, welcome in Jesus Christ. Born again in his baptism dying themselves to their old ways and patterns and rising again to new life. That's what Easter's all about. And I want to tell you some other good news too that needs to be said. Just as we see in the book of Acts, as Peter said, Jesus did good works until they crucified him and he raised. Now he's working through us, doing those same good works in the world, those same healings oftentimes. The same forgiving, even resurrecting the dead, Peter did. 
It's amazing. The same things that Jesus did, now the other disciples are doing them in their generation. But it just goes to show that Jesus was still there, and he is still here in our church and in the lives of his people. Jesus, I want you to think of the struggles you've had maybe this year or or recently. It doesn't take long to latch on to something that's gone wrong in our lives, right? Picture Jesus standing in the graveyard of that moment in time. Good morning, lady. Good morning, son. Good morning, daughter. Imagine Jesus into that tragedy of your life, lifting up the police tape and walking into the chalk line of what this world can do to us. And there he is. Good morning. It's a new day. Even those of us who know that each and every day of our lives we sin against God in our thoughts, words, and deeds. He visits the chalk lines of our thoughts, words, and deeds. And even there, he speaks peace and grace and forgiveness, coming across even the tragedies of our own doing in our life. And there Jesus speaks, my grace is new every morning. My mercy new every morning my peace and forgiveness every night when you go to sleep. I love the fact. Picture Jesus crossing the police lines. Imagine Jesus walking into the graveyard of a loved one that you miss so sorely. And the same Jesus stands there and watches the body placed into the ground. But he knows that one day that body will hear good morning again. I love this line. It's one of the earliest books of the New Testament that St. Paul wrote. And it shows us what the early church was latched onto. Let us latch onto this too. That graveyard again of that loved one we sorely miss. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And he will say, good morning. Welcome to the new heaven, the new earth, the new world that I have won for you. The next few verses of Matthew are the deception when the guards go and tell the chief priests what had happened. When they hear the evidence, they decide to ignore the facts and tell their own story. And here's the story we're going to tell. While it was still dark, those disciples outwitted you, finely trained Roman guards. They tricked you. And even though you sealed the the tomb, they got in and they took the body of Jesus and the whole thing's a lie. Now, if you're a Roman guard and you didn't do your job very well, that's not going to go well for you. And they said, we'll make sure Pilate doesn't touch you. And by the way, here's some money. The world always tells its news about Jesus. I want to say to you that those variations of that story have existed for thousands of years now amongst us. Some are told by professors and smart people their own version of the story that this didn't happen, a myth, a fable. But then there's always the story of those that saw Jesus, that grabbed and worshipped his resurrected feet that were nail scarred. Those that witnessed his death, his empty tomb, and his Easter greeting. And you're invited every year to ask, who will you believe? Some people will live life following the other stories that are told. But blessed are you who believe and who have not seen. Blessed are you who have set your minds on Christ. And instead of focusing on the crime scenes of our life, are focusing on Christ and investigating Him and knowing Him. Setting your minds on things above. Not things to come, but the things that are for us now. Blessed are you. Matthew tells that story. I'd like to invite you this Easter to think about where you are in that faith and where, how you can set your mind or, or make a step forward. What storyline are you believing? And once again, every year, it's the eyewitnesses versus the other stories. But what do the facts of the Holy Scriptures say? Well, they say, Alleluia, for 2,000 years. And they say, good morning, world. 
in the resurrection of Jesus. Amen. This crime scene, the tape is gone. It's pulled up. There is no police tape. He who was dead is alive and will be alive forevermore. And one day, with the voice of the archangel, he's coming for you to empty your tomb too. Amen.